The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Mastering the Use of Dual Antiplatelet Therapy for Preventing Recurrent Stroke. How well do your current strategies match with the experts? Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash SPE 860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. Welcome to Mastering the Use of Dual Antiplatelet Therapy for Preventing Recurrent Stroke. How well do your current strategies match with the experts? I'm Greg Albers from the Stanford Stroke Center, and I'm very pleased to be joined by Clay Johnston from the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas in Austin. We will be your panelists. All right, again, welcome. It's uh, great to have you here. Clay and I are very excited to be with, here with you tonight, whether you're joining us live from New Orleans or if you're attending virtually. I'll get us started with a brief introduction, and then I'll turn things over to Clay, who's gonna talk about the current evidence for dual antiplatelet therapy for secondary stroke prevention. And just as a reminder, look out for polling questions during the presentations. We're gonna be talking about TIA and minor stroke and the recurrent stroke risk that occurs after those events. We group those together because they're both common conditions and they're both associated with a high risk of early recurrence of ischemic stroke. As you can see from the slide, these are very common conditions, and these are patients who are likely to have a new active thrombus. And because of that, the risk of early recurrence is high. And we've known this for many years. This is a landmark study from Clay, which was published in JAMA more than 20 years ago. It shows that these patients who have a TIA or a minor stroke have a very high early recurrence risk, particularly over the first days to week substantial risk of an ischemic stroke, but that risk continues on for years after the event. Now, if we talk about mild stroke, it's really not as mild as it sounds. First of all, it's a common condition. If you look on the left at the Get With The Guidelines registry, you can see there's a large number of patients who present with low NIH stroke scales, five or less. But if you follow these patients over a few months or even a year, what you can see is that the good outcome rates are not terrific. About a third of these patients will be disabled over the course of the next several months to year, and the mortality rate is on the order of 10%. What we're gonna talk about tonight is uh, uh, evidence from the major trials. We'll talk about the guidelines, and we'll try to use this evidence to apply to a number of patients. And we'll look in detail about how the management of these patients is influenced by the results of these large randomized trials. The first patient is named Eleanor. She's an 85-year-old white woman who had the sudden onset of left-sided weakness while she was eating breakfast. A neighbor in her apartment building heard her call out, and after falling to the floor, and the neighbor called 911. Eleanor has hypertension. She takes an ACE inhibitor. She's on a statin for hyperlipidemia, and both her blood pressure and lipids are currently well-controlled. Her laboratory studies are remarkable only for borderline anemia, and on exam in the hospital, seven hours after onset, she had left-sided neglect and incomplete face, arm, and leg weakness, and her NIH stroke scale was three, so it was very mild weakness. The CT reveals an infarct. All her large vessels appear patent on the CT angiogram. And pardon me, the CT did not reveal an infarct, but the MRI did show a small acute infarct in the right frontal lobe. So, what antiplatelet therapy would you recommend for Eleanor? All right, we're gonna move right into Master Class 1, which is getting to know your options, a review of the current evidence for DAPT with P2Y12 inhibitors, and it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Clay Johnston from the Dell Medical School at the University of Texas at Austin. Clay, take, that, take us through. Thanks, Greg. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here, and I... I'm sorry we're not there together in, uh, in New Orleans, but uh, hopefully next year. Um, and uh, so now I'm going to go through some of the evidence that, hopes, that I hope will help you to answer that Eleanor case uh, um, with, a, with a little more confidence. So um, the recent trials now have been incorporated into the guidelines, both for the European Stroke Organization and also for the um, uh, American Stroke, American Heart. Um, and um, I, I'm gonna, rather than review these in detail, 
I'm going to go through the evidence behind them, and then Greg's going to return to these and and uh, and uh, uh, talk about them, uh, having reviewed you know all the evidence behind them. Um, now, what we're not talking much about is dual antiplatelet therapy in the long term. So when initiated, not in the acute period, but days to weeks to months after um, a, a TIA or stroke. Um, in, you know, there are multiple trials that have um, evaluated dual antiplatelet therapy in these settings here. The three biggest ones, the most important ones, all of these trials uh, were negative. Um, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy, when you don't initiate it right up front, it doesn't really work. And, um, you know, sometimes there's an associated risk of, of, uh, of hemorrhage. I mean, there's always a risk of hemorrhage and sometimes of, of hemorrhagic stroke. So that is different when you initiate therapy um, acutely, and that's what we're going to focus on today because that's where the, the newest evidence is. Um, and you know th th these are the these are the big trials um, in this space. Uh, they uh, they go back to publication of 2013 of the Chance trial, all the way up to um, just recently the Chance two trial publication. Um, in so I'm going to start by uh, reviewing the the uh, initial trials in this space of uh, clopidogrel aspirin versus aspirin alone. So Chance and Point were actually very, very similar trials. Uh, they were actually designed at the same time by the same people. So, um, you know, we um, uh, worked together um, uh, to, to uh, put these trials together. Our double-blind placebo-controlled randomized trials, and they're asking the question, in patients with acute mild ischemic stroke or high-risk TIA, you know, using ABCD squared score to define uh, high risk, is clopidogrel with aspirin superior to aspirin alone in preventing subsequent stroke and ischemic events. And they're, again, because they were designed really at the same time, they're more similar than different in, their, uh, in terms of their design. Chance used a smaller loading dose than point for clopidogrel, and it only treated with combination therapy for 21 days before moving on to single drug therapy, whereas point treated for a full 90 days of the combination. Um, and then the entry criteria were quite similar. Point required within 12 hours, chance within 24, otherwise the same. And then the really important difference is that chance was only in China, whereas point was international, not in China. Um, and um, uh, you know that they, they did a wonderful job of getting things done quickly in, in China, but, um, but then it did raise questions about generalizability and um, uh, that took a while to resolve. So chance, so I'm, I, I'm reviewing this stuff in just a, a small number of slides, so not much lead up, but bottom line, chance was very positive. Um, and again, this goes back to 2013, so almost a decade ago, we had um, evidence that dual antiplatelet therapy could work in the acute setting. And um, that separation occurred very early on, and it persisted for uh, out through the 90-day the period. Ends up in, in later analyses that 21 days um, captured the uh, most of the, really all of the benefit of the, of the combination. Of course, that's for their trial when both drugs were being used together. And it was also safe in chance, the combination. Um, there, there were more, there were more sort of mild bleeds, at least trending towards more mild bleeds in the clopidogrel aspirin group, but for severe and moderate bleeds, they did not see an increase. And that was a surprise. So then later, Point came along. So actually, Point was started before Chance, but uh, the, the uh, Tian group in China and the, and the Chinese are just amazing trialists, and they were able to get it done incredibly quickly. Uh, it took us a lot longer. Um, and um, uh, so it didn't come out until 2018. But similar uh, findings in terms of efficacy, a separation early on that persisted uh, throughout the 90-day um, uh, treatment course. Um, and uh, outcome was major ischemic events, which included um, ischemic stroke, MI, and ischemic vascular death. 
Um, major hemorrhage was increased, um, though, in point, uh, and that hadn't been seen in chance, um, with more than a doubling in risk, although the absolute risk was quite small. So here, you know, the, the um, uh, y-axis is uh, exaggerated here to 10%, not 100%. It's a half percent difference. So it's a, it's a small risk, but it's real. Most of those were GI hemorrhages. Um, a predefined analysis from point was to look at the zero to 30 days versus the 31 to 90 days. And the zero to 30 days really captured the benefit of, of dual antiplatelet therapy. And then the secondary analysis, the optimal duration of treatment was actually 21 days. So consistent with what chance had seen. Um, so it may make more sense just, you know, again, it's always gotta be careful cutting data after um, a randomized trial data, a uh, randomized trial uh, was done, but at least it suggests that you know, most of that benefit, if really not all, is occurring in the early period, whereas that hemorrhage risk is spread out throughout um, the, the time in which people are treated with dual antiplatelet therapy. Okay, so bottom line on that, you know, and starting on the left here, is that uh, clopidogrel and aspirin, it works for this, you know, in this acute setting. And it's pretty safe um, compared with aspirin alone. And meta-analysis, yes, there's an increased risk of, of, uh, of bleeding, but you know, not mostly reversible bleeding, you know, a GI bleeds, and so um, look pretty good. And that's a pretty big treatment effect, you know, a 25% uh, uh, risk reduction, pretty good. So that's the clopidogrel and aspirin data. Next was this, this notion that maybe ticagrelor would work better um, because it's, uh, it has a greater consistency in effect. And Greg's going to talk some more about this later in terms of the differences between uh, ticagrelor and clopidogrel. But given that the possibility of ticagrelor might work better, um, we um, studied ticagrelor versus aspirin alone. Um, and, uh, you know, the, um, let me let me just show you how that how that went. I mean, I think a lot of you know this. That was the Socrates trial, um, and that was published in 2016, and uh, that was a a very large trial international. Um, in we initiated treatment uh, within 24 hours after symptom onset and continued that uh, treatment for 90 days. And again, it's ticagrelor alone versus aspirin alone. And is it, the question was, is it useful in um, uh, reducing uh, stroke uh, death MI? Um, and as you can see from the results, it does, you know, it did appear like the, the ticagrelor would be superior, but in fact, it's not. Um, the hazard ratio is 0.89 and uh, the p-value 0.067. So, you know, maybe it was close, but, uh, you know, no close in in clinical trials, so um, we didn't have evidence that ticagrelor was superior to aspirin in, in this group. Um, happily, it, it didn't produce more hemorrhage anyway, um, so uh, you know, at least reassuring, but again, not so relevant when, when it doesn't, when you don't have evidence that it actually works. And then um, we had known that we were gonna look carefully at the patients who came in on aspirin. Um, and uh, the reason was that, you know, those who come in on aspirin, that aspirin's gonna have an effect for a couple weeks afterwards um, because of its irreversible effect on platelets. And so those on aspirin, when they came in, when they're randomized to ticagrelor, effectively they're getting ticagrelor aspirin. And sure enough, that group did better compared to those that were randomized to continue on aspirin. Um, and so given that, we went uh, back to say, okay, gosh, maybe we should have studied dual antiplatelet therapy initially. Let's, uh, let's go back and, and, um, and study that now. And so that was the TALUS trial. So this was a, another gigantic trial, 11,000 patients, international, um, treatment that began within 24 hours, just 30 days, trying to keep uh, the trial simpler now, knowing that most of the effect was in that first 30 days. Um, and we asked the question, you know, in that same high-risk group of patients with minor stroke and TIA, 
is dual antiplatelet therapy with ticagrelor and aspirin superior to aspirin alone in preventing uh, subsequent stroke or death. And um, in, in fact, it was. So, you know, bottom line, um, hazard ratio of 0.83. Again, that early separation that persisted out through the 30 days. Um, so in a, you know, a decent treatment effect, not quite as large as was seen in uh, point in chance, but you know, different population, different duration of treatment. Um, so you know, hard to make an indirect comparison. Um, most of that effect was in ischemic stroke. And remember for point, it was all ischemic events um, and so there, the hazard ratio was even more similar to what was seen in point, point 0.79. But again, you know, huge overlap in these um, as well. If there's been a lot of confusion about disability, I wish we hadn't done it this way. One of the secondary outcomes was just to look at the proportion of people with disability treated with ticagrelor versus placebo. But remember, a lot of these folks had disability from their index event, their index stroke. And so that ends up overwhelming any impact on disability from a new stroke. So when we looked at disability associated with a disabling stroke and just said, you know, are there more disabling strokes in one group versus the other? In fact, there is an effect. So um, uh, the ticagrelor aspirin does reduce disabling strokes. It doesn't reduce global disability, but again, there's a ton of noise in global disability in this population. And this just sort of lays out that that effect occurs over a different, a variety of different ways of, of uh, you know, defining disability based on the MRS score, you know, modified Rankin scale. And, uh, in, you know, that's a, you know, it's pretty robust over a, a series of uh, definitions of, of disability. Again, a secondary analysis, but just important to clarify, it, it's not that it's not impacting disabling strokes or disability associated with new strokes. It is, um, but, the, but you can't see an effect in global disability. Um, there is definitely an increased risk of hemorrhage with ticagrel or aspirin compared to aspirin alone. Um, the hazard ratio is almost four, um, but the absolute size is pretty small. So 0.4% um, increase in hemorrhage. And whereas in point, most of those hemorrhages were GI, in talus, most of those hemorrhages are intracranial or fatal bleeds, um, as you can see from, from this chart. Um, and so, you know, a little more worrisome that we're getting events that, that, um, that really do impact people. Um, that being said, you know, it's a four to one ratio of a reduction of ischemic events to increase in hemorrhagic events probably similar impact of, of those in those two groups. So still risk benefit um, favors uh, uh, treatment um, overall in, in the trial. Okay, so now back to Eleanor. So Greg described her already. Um, uh, she uh, is this, you know, the 85 year old who uh, uh, came in with a, uh, with a minor stroke. Um, and now back to the question, which um, antiplatelet uh, treatment would you recommend for, for uh, Eleanor? Greg, I'll, I think you know, you're going to go through some of, of the, the details uh, uh, later about the differences between the two therapies. But what's your, what's your take on the Eleanor case or not? I mean, it's, uh, uh, without getting into uh, clopidogrel ticagrelor, what's your... What's your feeling? Yeah, well, clearly this is somebody we would uh, jump on right away with dual antiplatelet therapy. Uh, she's got a minor stroke. She's come in very early after onset. Uh, she's not a candidate for thrombolysis or thrombectomy. So I'd be looking at a dual antiplatelet therapy over a short period of time, like three weeks, uh, four weeks. And I'd also be evaluating her to make sure that we're not missing a cardiac source of emboli. You know, could she have paroxysmal atrial fibrillation? Uh, because that obviously would change the, the, the longer term treatment. But for the short term, I think she's an ideal candidate for dual therapy and it, she really fits in uh, to be a typical patient from the, the studies that you just reviewed. Yeah, yeah, good. Yeah, and I, I, I agree. And I, you know, we should have 
let's just underline that cardio embolic stroke, those patients were not included, uh, presumed cardioembolic and strokes were not included in any of those trials because we've got therapies for them, right? We've got anticoagulation, so right, therapy for that group, at least the, we know that for the, the AFib-associated events. Um, and the other group, too, that's excluded is anybody who needs thrombolysis, um, and, uh, and she's not that either. Um, so yeah, dual any play the therapies, start it, ASAP, right? I mean, there's no reason to delay. Um, the trials really would suggest if you're going to affect that curve, that steep curve, you're going to have to treat right away. Yeah, so loading dose and then standard therapy for at least three weeks. And then what do you, you know, there we have two different loading doses tested in trials, 600 and 300. You know, I have my own, <laughs> that, now I'm talking about uh, clopidogrel. I have my own um, uh, biases about that, but what, yeah, what's your take? What do you guys do? Uh, we typically do the, the 300. Uh, I, I think, you know, some prefer 600, but I, as you say, two trials both had, you know, similar positive results. But what, what's your, your take? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I'm partial to points way of doing it just because, you know, the rationale for it was get it, you know, get the antiplatelet on board ASAP. And, and you can do that a little better, at least theoretically, with the 600. But I recognize that you know, patients look at that big pile of pills that you're trying to get them to take, and they're like, what? So you know, I, I understand. And, and we don't have real evidence that it, it, it made a, a difference in, in point compared to chance. So back to the Eleanor case. So, um, uh, so uh, she was started on dual antiplatelet therapy right away, so awesome. Um, but her uh, daughter, a medical student, uh, raises concerns about uh, bleeding and uh, and polypharmacy. Um, so, so, Greg, how do you how do you handle uh, one of these uh, uh, pesky medical medical student family members? Well, it's a, a great opportunity for education. It's always important for family members to understand the rationale for the treatments we're giving. And here with a medical student, uh, there's even more opportunity to to talk about. Uh, why we have these different classes of medicines. Uh, clearly, she's got multiple vascular risk factors, hypertension, her high cholesterol are gonna be treated with separate medications. These medications are compatible with each other. And then uh, probably what she's digging into is the fact that there's two medicines from the same class. Why are we giving two antiplatelets rather than one? And, and you just illustrated it beautifully that there is risk, but the benefit outweighs the risk. So we're particularly concerned about uh, Eleanor having a, an early recurrent stroke. So we really want to hit the platelets hard with the dual antiplatelet uh, therapy to try to get that thrombus uh, uh, calm down. And we acknowledge the risk of bleeding and there are going to be things that you can do to mitigate the risk. So uh, I, I think we can, we can probably get the medical student over the hump here and, and uh, at least get three weeks of dual therapy and, and realizing that it's a short term uh, risk of bleeding uh, it should also help reassure the student. Yeah, so we, yeah, I, it, we're not talking about lifelong polypharmacy. We're talking about short-term polypharmacy. Although she's, she's, she's bought lifelong single antiplatelet therapy, of course. But, you know, that's simple. People are used to that. Okay, and then now the patient agrees to uh, take all the prescribed medications. But then on day seven of therapy, the, her crit is noted to be falling, and colonoscopy reveals a non-obstructed malignant lesion near the hepatic flexure. Okay, so now problems with bleeding. So Greg, how do you, uh, how do you approach this? Yeah, so the plot has clearly thickened here. Uh, it was interesting that she had some uh, borderline anemia when she came in with the stroke, and, and probably this, this tumor has been responsible for that. And now it sounds like her, uh, her bleeding has accelerated. Uh, possibly because of the, the dual antiplatelet therapy. So one of the important things to do is to figure out what's going to be the approach to this lesion. If there is going to be a, a surgery to resect part of the colon, uh, I want to talk to the surgeon and see what they're comfortable with. Uh, in general, they would not be comfortable with dual antiplatelet therapy going into a, a surgery. So the decision would be whether we just stop it for a, a period of time, get that colon cancer taken care of, assuming it hasn't metastasized, 
and then uh, go back to the uh, therapy uh, afterwards. And by that point, I'd probably just go back to the single therapy. We made it through the first week, which is the highest risk week with the dual therapy. And then by the time we get this tumor uh, sorted out, I suspect we're gonna be probably getting out close to the 21 day duration that I would be thinking of for dual therapy for this patient. Great. Yeah, and I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't be mad at doing any, plate, any platelet therapy in this instance, right? It, it revealed a tumor. It actually served a fantastic Absolutely. function. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So and again, I think we tend to focus on, oh gosh, you know, a bleeding complication. You know, sometimes that's not a bad thing. Um, in this case, it wasn't a bad thing. Um, all right. So now another case. Um, so this is Constance. So she's 87 years old lives with her 62-year-old son and noticed that she recently began favoring her left side and seems to have difficulty picking up small objects. Um, and uh, her son reports that she's had some strokes before and she has AFib, um, doesn't use alcohol, tobacco. Lab studies um, are uh, uh, remarkable for elevated glucose or INR is 2.2, hemoglobin's 10, She's got AFib on her, on her ECG. The blood pressure is just mildly elevated. She's on metformin, lisinopril, levothyroxine, um, omeprazole, uh, um, rivastigmine, um, warfarin, and uh, multivitamins. Um, mildly visually impaired, um, difficulty with some verbal instructions, and in stroke scale score is four. And then her CT shows a small infarct in the right parietal lobe, multiple old infarcts um, noted in the left and right cerebellum and, and uh, cerebrum. So what do you think of this uh, patient of Constance? Is uh, she a candidate for um, an antiplatelet therapy? And if so, uh, 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 which one? Yeah, so this is a patient with uh, multiple prior infarcts. She's got a a presumably new uh, uh, acute or subacute infarct in the right parietal lobe to fit with her symptoms where she's having trouble with her left side. Uh, she's on warfarin with a therapeutic INR. It's, it's a little bit on the lower side, but still uh, in the therapeutic range. So to answer the question, antiplatelet therapy would not be what I would be thinking about here. Uh, some people would wonder if I added the antiplatelet therapy to our warfarin, will I get more protection since she seems to have you know, had this stroke despite the warfarin? But in general, what the studies have shown is that that strategy of adding antiplatelet on top of the warfarin for non-valvular AFib patients uh, leads to more bleeding without more benefit. So one of the things I'm asking whenever I see a patient who's anticoagulated and, and has another stroke, uh, if they're in the therapeutic range, is, is there another cause? You know, did they have a dissection? Is there intracranial athro? Is there vasculitis? Is there something else that's not gonna to respond to warfarin that might need to be treated differently? But assuming that all we have is the atrial fibrillation after evaluation, what I would be thinking about is switching the warfarin to a, a DOAC. Uh, there is certainly evidence that the DOACs are a bit more effective than warfarin. They're also much more convenient. Uh, so I think that's the way I, I would go and I would, I would stay away from adding an antiplatelet. How about you, Clay? Would, would you treat her any differently? No, I would treat her just the way you described. That just makes sense that uh, um, you know, maybe she was under anticoagulated in the, at a prior point and that set up the thrombus that now we're dealing with the consequences for. So I like the DOAC plan. And uh, yeah, I wouldn't recommend adding an antiplatelet agent. I mean, occasionally we do that. I'm sure you do as well. Add an aspirin to um, anticoagulation, but I'm, it always makes me uncomfortable knowing, you know, the data is just not very strong um, and, uh, and definitely has an associated increased risk of hemorrhage. That brings me to, towards the end of my part of this presentation. I mean, I think the key takeaways from this part are we got to get these folks, the high-risk TIAs, the minor ischemic strokes, we have to get them on dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, preferably within 24 hours. We, we can talk about that later, whether it's ever okay to treat um, when you can't treat within the first 24 hours, um, but, but we got to do it. And that, you know, we're not doing that right now uh, in, uh, you know, consistently based on little pieces of data that I've, I've seen. I, I think we're going to need to track it um, 
and make us more accountable for it, but we're missing a lot of opportunity to prevent new events. We only need to treat for 21 to 30 days, I think. I'm totally comfortable with that, even though the trials um, weren't always done that way. Um, the, the evidence collectively really suggests that's plenty of time. And then this, this choice of whether to use clopidogrel or ticagrelor is complicated. And it's so complicated that, that I, I'm inadequate to cover it, and I'm going hand to hand it over to the big gun, Greg Albers, to, uh, to opine. So uh, uh, with that, um, over, over to you, Greg. Thanks, Clay. Yeah, so we will uh, talk about some of that complex data and see if we can sort through it uh, the best we can. And just before we dive back into uh, some data, let's go in a little bit more detail over these guidelines that, that Clay already introduced. If we start with uh, the European stroke uh, recommendations, you can see that uh, both the aspirin clopidogrel combination from Point and Chance were recommended as well as the option for ticagrelor and aspirin as in the Thales study. And you can see that they, these recommendations reflect the inclusion criteria for the study. So point and chance, we're looking at the, the lower NIH stroke scale, three or less for the minor stroke, whereas in the ticagrelor studies, they were going up a little bit more towards the, the mild to moderate, getting up to an NIH of five or less. You can also see there's a little bit of difference in the ABCD2 scores for the TIA patients uh, between the, the trials. But, you know, fairly overlapping population, and basically they're giving you a couple of choices. Uh, the ASA, AHA recommendations on the right, not too dissimilar. Uh, they rank uh, the treatments with the standard uh, HA levels. And you can see because there is more substantial data from the trials on aspirin plus clopidogrel, we have more trials, more data, uh, it's getting the level 1A recommendation. And, and again, here they're going on to the you know, 21 to 90 days. And I think most uh, uh, stroke neurologists like Clay are, are on the 21 day side of that uh, and for the reasons that, that Clay uh, reviewed very nicely. So there's a nice recommendation there for these, these patients and uh, NIH score less than three. They've got an ABCD squared of, of four or more if they're a TIA patient uh, to use that combination. And then for a, a level 2B, uh, we have the similar recommendation for the ticagrelor plus aspirin. Here they go for the 30 days, which was the, the trial duration there for the Thales trial. And as mentioned, you can pop up to the little bit higher NIH per the inclusion criteria of that study. All right, so let's dig a little bit deeper into the differences between these uh, agents. And, and the one head-to-head -head, uh, large randomized trial um, that was performed comparing clopidogrel aspirin to ticagrelor aspirin. So first of all, if you can see here that one of the, uh, the main differences is that clopidogrel is a prodrug, which means it has to be metabolized by the liver. And as you're aware, there's variable liver metabolism with some people being faster metabolizers, some people being normal, and some people being uh, slower metabolizers. So that can lead to different activity of the clopidogrel in different patient populations. Ticagrelor, it is a, an active drug which doesn't require that liver metabolism for it to, to do its work. Uh, you see the, the dosing, as we talked about, there is uh, two different loading doses uh, used in the clopidogrel aspirin trials. So that's dealer's choice there, and then 75 milligrams a day, whereas the ticagrelor trial was the loading of 180 and then followed by 90 twice a day. So one is a twice a day drug and one is a once a day. So if that's important, there's a difference there. You can see half-lives are, are slightly different uh, between the drugs, uh, but there's a lot of, of, of similarity uh, as well as, as the differences here. Now, in terms of the, the CYP2C19, that's going to be the, the key area for these loss of function alleles because this is uh, what, what is going to activate that clopidogrel. And you can see that uh, nothing is simple. And here, it's not so simple as that you're a, a good metabolizer or a bad metabolizer. Uh, most of the patients, you can see in the center of the trial, a slide here, most of them are normal metabolizers, but that's going to depend a little bit on your racial background uh, because particularly the Chinese, in particular the Han Chinese, 
have a much higher incidence of people having this intermediate to poor metabolizer state. And that means you're either carrying uh, you know, one of the uh, loss of function alleles or a small percentage actually carry both of the loss of function alleles. So you can see there's a wide range of efficiency of metabolizing uh, clopidogrel. So does it matter? That's been a, a debate for many years. How much does it matter if you're one of these patients who's got a loss of function allele for the CYP2C19, does clopidogrel still work for you? Um, and this is just to uh, demonstrate uh, where the metabolism is occurring. There's multiple em uh, enzymes, but the CYP2C19 is, is critical. It activates the clopidogrel, so it can then inhibit the PG P2Y12 receptor, whereas for uh, ticagular, it, it's a direct effect. So some of the, the more substantial data that we have in the stroke field came from this substudy of the CHANCE trial, which was published in JAMA way back in uh, 2016. So we've known this for several years. And what we're looking at is that this was a Chinese trial. So there were a number of patients who had uh, carriers of one of the loss of uh, subfunction alleles. And if you look at them down at uh, uh, the bottom, you can see that the carriers in red did not do nearly as well as the non-carriers. So if you're a normal metabolizer of clopidogrel, your stroke rates in the CHANCE trial were substantially lower than if you carried one of the alleles. And in fact, if you carried one of those uh, loss of functional alleles, you were similar to uh, uh, aspirin results. In fact, it wasn't statistically different from aspirin for that group of patients. Whereas if you were a non-carrier, you can see this is a, a very dramatic benefit uh, from aspirin. So this was su suggesting, yes, that the, the genetic variability does make a difference in the response uh, to clopidogrel. They also did notice in the, this trial that if you were somebody who was carrying one of these loss of function alleles, uh, you didn't have as much bleeding, which makes sense, right? You're not activating the drug, you're not getting as much efficacy, but you're also not getting as much of the, the bleeding. And this is uh, the biggest trial, the one I just showed you for out of chance to look at this issue, but you can see there's a, a whole range of uh, other trials, many of them from, from China, uh, they're smaller, but when you add them all together in this meta-analysis, you can see that there's really little question that if you're carrying a loss of function allele, that your stroke risk on clopidogrel is higher than if you are not, you know, if you're a normal metabolizer. So as we've already mentioned, uh, ticagular bypasses that liver metabolism. It can directly inhibit uh, the PTY2 receptor, so you don't have to worry about, you know, are they a, a fast or slow metabolizer. So the head-to-head -head, uh, trial to try to really drill down on you know, the question, does it matter, uh, is the CHANCE-2 trial. And this is one that just was published uh, a few months ago in the New England Journal. So let's take a look at what uh, the CHANCE-2 study uh, did. Uh, again, a, a large number of patients, over 6,202 sites in China. So that way you're gonna have the opportunity to find patients who have a loss of function allele, and that's who was enrolled in this trial. So this trial was unique in that it only enrolled patients who had poor, uh, were poor metabolizers of clopidogrel. So you would anticipate that the ticagular plus aspirin would likely be more effective than the clopidogrel plus aspirin if you believe this loss of function allele really makes a difference. And lo and behold, uh, it did make a difference. And the benefit here was, was quite convincing. You can see a p-value with a couple of uh, zeros after the decimal point. And the, the absolute benefit here was really comparable to the benefit that we saw in the trials that Clay reviewed between dual versus aspirin. Dual versus single had a similar benefit to what we saw here. Again, over a, a 20% uh, risk reduction. So a substantial benefit to these patients who had the loss of function allele to be on the ticagular aspirin versus clopidogrel aspirin. That's in terms of efficacy preventing stroke, what about the downsides? Uh, bleeding, and again, you might expect a little bit more bleeding here because you've got people who are not metabolizing the clopidogrel as well, uh, and then you're comparing to you know, full effect ticagular plus aspirin. Uh, and interestingly, we really did not see the bleeding concern here. If you look at the, the type of bleeds that you would worry about, intracranial hemorrhages, fatal bleeds, severe or moderate bleeding, really no difference at all. You do see a difference in the mild category. You can see there, uh, 
5% uh, with mild versus 2.2. So th there certainly is evidence that there is a more bleeding effect here in, in patients who are having the ticagular effect compared to patients who are clearly having a bit of a blunted effect from the clopidogrel because of their metabolism status. So that brings us uh, to uh, our next patient, who's uh, Zhang. And this is a 65-year-old Asian male, happens to be Han Chinese, and has had sudden onset right-sided weakness, difficulty finding words while he's walking with his wife. His wife calls 911, but the symptoms resolve by the time he gets to the hospital. He's got uh, some vascular risk factors, hypertension and diabetes. He's on appropriate medications for those. Uh, although he does see, have a little bit of an elevated uh, glucose and a hemoglobin A1C on his labs. An hour after onset, he's completely normal in the ER. He's got an ABCD score, which is five. Uh, CT, it doesn't show an infarct um, and all large vessels appear patent on his CT angiogram. ECG looks fine. So Clay, question for uh, Zhang. Uh, what antiplatelet therapy uh, would you recommend for him? Yeah, so, so first of all, the key is that he needs to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. So, you know, we're catching him early. He's a high-risk TIA, so he needs to be on dual antiplatelet therapy. And then the, the, the second question is, which combination? And, uh, you know, you nicely showed, I think, the most important data on this. So Han Chinese, so the, the, the likelihood that he has, that he's a, a poor a metabolizer of clopidogrel is actually more than 50%. So, you know, I think I'd, I would feel a little uncomfortable giving him something that, um, that may not work for him. Probably can't get a genetic test right away. So my choice would be ticagrelor and aspirin. Um, you know, we, we, with chance two, we have head-to-head -head data, at least in those that, that don't metabolize. And, um, you know, again, more likely than not, he doesn't metabolize. And then we can fall back to indirect comparisons um, to, uh, to say, well, it's a fine choice overall anyway. Yeah, I agree. And uh, so did the physician who was treating Zhang because he was started uh, promptly on Ticagalor with a loading dose and aspirin for a planned 30-day course. Uh, but all plans don't always uh, come out the way we plan because a week later, uh, he's calling and complaining of, of dyspnea. So the question is, how are you going to handle that? Are you going to stop the medication? What, what do you do when they call back and are having some, some dyspnea on ticagrelor? Yeah. So, so this is a known issue with ticagrelor. So in, in, uh, you know, obviously it could be something else. So you, know, you want to be thinking about, you know, could it be uh, another cause? But it's actually fairly common with Ticagalor. We were concerned about it going into Socrates and Talus. It ends up, it was, it was very infrequent in Socrates and, and Talus. It's been more frequent in cardiac trials, probably because those patients are more attuned to, you know, any change in breathing than our stroke patients are. Um, but um, it very rarely led to discontinuation of therapy in the approach that we took was just to reassure folks and generally goes away after, you know, it's just a sensation goes away after two, three days. It's a, it's an, it's an adenosine effect. So it has nothing to do with, you know, pulmonary function or, um, you know, fluid in the line, anything like that. It doesn't make heart failure, nothing. It's just a direct adenosine effect and it's, and it's, a, it's producing the sensation. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so both in uh, Socrates and in Thales, uh, although we were concerned about it, it really did not turn out to be a, a big issue, but it is certainly important for physicians to be aware of this. And as you said, the, the cardiac docs are, are, are more in tune to this because it, it was m more common in their trials. And uh, certainly for them, the, the constant question is, you know, is this the drug or is this their underlying uh, cardiopulmonary disease, which is flaring up? Uh, so this is a, an algorithm that has uh, been a, adapted from a cardiac uh, uh, article in uh, European Heart, which gives physicians some advice on, on how to do this. And it just follows exactly what you said. First question is, you know, 
can I eliminate other problems? Uh, are they going into congestive heart failure? Do they have a pulmonary problem? And if you uh, don't find any evidence of that, uh, then you start thinking this could be ticagular-related dyspnea, and you want to see how long is it going to last. So, uh, you know, oftentimes it's going to just go away on its own with reassurance over a few days. Um, if it's still there a few days later, then you have to really ask, you know, is the patient able to tolerate it with the reassurance, or are they just really feeling uncomfortable? If they're quite uncomfortable, then you could consider uh, switching to an alternative antiplatelet agent. Uh, but in most situations with the ticlopidine, pardon me, ticagular related, uh, you're, you're going to be looking at just a, a few days to a week for this to, to disappear. So uh, again, it, uh, not a big issue in our stroke population, but certainly something that physicians need to be aware of so they can handle the phone calls. All right, so uh, how to decide. Uh, Clay, you did a, a great job of, of summing up some of the the pros and cons. I mean, clopidogrel, we have a, a larger database at this point and slightly stronger recommendations from the American Heart Association based on that. Uh, it's out as a generic drug. It's less expensive. It's once a day. Ticagalor, big, big advantage is, is for these people who uh, you're worried about having a loss of function allele because you don't have the genetic variability. Uh, the trials included slightly more moderate stroke severity, so you might think about that if you've got somebody who didn't quite meet the minor stroke criteria for point or chance, uh, and it does have a, an FDA approval for stroke prevention. So let's, let's jump into another patient. This is Hugo. He's a 72-year-old Hispanic man. He's been uh, diagnosed with a left hemisphere TIA a couple of weeks ago. He was started on clopidogrel and aspirin uh, you know, very quickly after those TIAs, the planned 21-day course. Uh, but today, he has a similar episode, so another uh, TIA-like episode, sounds like a left hemisphere event with uh, receptive and expressive language dysfunction and some right-sided body numbness that lasts 15 minutes. He comes into urgent care. He's got hypertension. He says he's been compliant with his uh, ACE inhibitor as well as the clopidogrel aspirin combination. His lab studies look good, and he's got an ABCD score, uh, squared score of 4. So one of the questions, uh, Clay, is w would you test th this guy to see maybe he's, uh, you know, clopidogrel refractory based on the fact that he's continuing to have TIAs while on uh, clopidogrel aspirin? Well, it does, it does make me wonder. Um, in you know, presumably we don't know, yeah, he's, he's Hispanic, so um, his risk um, could be, um, of having, you know, of being a poor metabolizer for clopidogrel could be about, you know, 25, 30%. Um, so he's certainly at risk for not being a metabolizer. I'm, I'm curious. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if it's easy to get that genetic test, then yeah, it'd be nice. It'd be nice to have it. Uh, not too expensive. I'd, I'd like to know. Yeah, and that's one of the, the issues. Uh, what we've been told by our uh, hematology folks at Stanford is very shortly we're going to have a point of care, you know, quick turnaround test, which I think would be really helpful for, for Hugo so that we could know. Uh, 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 right now it's a send out and it's going to take several days to come back. And really you want to make a decision today. Uh, but as we talked before, when somebody is having recurrent events, it's always really important to, to think, you know, is there anything else that be, can be going on, anything else? Uh, other than just uh, some atherosclerosis, uh, you know, could there be a, a cardiac source? Could there be a dissection, other condition, uh, drug abuse, et cetera, that, that could be playing a role? So, you know, thinking about a, a full evaluation when somebody's now had, you know, three events over a short period of time. All right, that's great. So let's now uh, look at the key takeaways from this section. Uh, what we've uh, emphasized that these uh, CYP 2C19 elastofunctional functional alleles uh, do occur. They occur with different frequencies and different populations of, of individuals, so we need to be aware of that. Uh, you can test for these or you can make an assumption, as Clay did for our Han Chinese patient, that he likely does have uh, one of these uh, loss of functional alleles, and uh, that could be a, a strong argument to go with Ticagalor in that situation. Uh, if uh, you're looking at somebody who is very limited uh, financially, we have a, a drug that's off patent versus one that, that's on. So there's price differences. One is, drug is twice a day, one is once a day. So again, that 
can be important to, to some people, although most of our patients were, uh, had other medical conditions and were taking medications more than once a day. Let's now jump on to uh, our third masterclass, and then we'll uh, be looking forward to taking your questions. And here we're going to talk a little bit about patient-centered strategies to improve adherence. And I think Clay mentioned earlier that sometimes patients are not taking these medications that we've prescribed, and uh, oftentimes we assume they are. And maybe if we explain it more clearly and have a more patient-centered discussion, we could increase uh, the chance that these patients are are really taking their medication. So uh, the recommendations uh, indicate that we should individualize therapy. Just as we discussed, there are patient-specific factors, there's cost, there's tolerance of the agents, there's the efficacy that we've been discussing, as well as other clinical characteristics to take in mind. And then we should think about how we're going to communicate uh, why we're using two agents and why we chose the agents that we did. Uh, so we call this shared decision-making, and I think uh, everybody has learned about this in, in medical school, but putting it into practice sometimes is, is a little more challenging. Uh, you can see this physician is having a lot of questions about, uh, you know, how do I do this? Do I have time to do this? Is this really going to make a difference? And there certainly is evidence that it does make a difference, that if you can really get the patient on board with helping to share the decision and, and then they're behind it and more likely to to carry it out. Uh, so there are many barriers. Uh, some healthcare uh, folks like to really be more paternalistic. They don't want to have a challenge to their autonomy. Um, they uh, sometimes don't enjoy making uh, detailed discussions with patients where the patients are bringing up uh, of concerns or challenging the physician's judgment. And, and time plays a big role, right? It, everybody would love to have more time to explain things more uh, in more detail to the patient, but when there's a full waiting room, uh, we don't always have that time. Uh, the patients often uh, would like to participate, but they're afraid that they can't understand the terminology, that if we're, we're not speaking at the patient level, uh, they can get confused, and they don't want to embarrass themselves by asking what they think are, are maybe not smart questions. There's also uh, decision aids that could help with this where the patient could learn about this before they dis uh, discuss it with the physician or, or read about it and then talk uh, uh, in more detail uh, in a more educated uh, manner at the next clinic visit, uh, but oftentimes these decision uh, aids are not available. So one of the, the key issues is time. You have to set aside time because it, it takes a while to be able to figure out what's the patient perspective what are their concerns and what are their beliefs about these type of, of medications and medications in general. Oftentimes we, we assume that the patient understands when we give a nice clear explanation, but then when you come back later and you ask, uh, you know, what did you understand? It's often only a fraction of, of what we thought we taught. And uh, one of the, the more common reasons that we see uh, patients in our outpatient stroke clinic at, at Stanford is they, they had a stroke somewhere and, and they left the hospital really having no idea uh, why they had the stroke, uh, either because it wasn't well explained or because they weren't in a position to really uh, understand that explanation. They're still very distressed. They've had a stroke and they're just coming back and, and hearing uh, in a calm setting uh, what's happened, why it's happened, and what are the choices. Uh, this is an interesting uh, study uh, from Journal of Neuroscience Nursing where they're asking people from uh, different cultural backgrounds uh, what they think about medications. And if you read through these, you can see that it is you know, very, very different. Some people think medications are a panacea, and if you miss one, you're in huge trouble. Other people are, are very skeptical. They think medicines in general do more harm than good. Some think they're poison. Some think that every medicine is addictive. So there's a lot of misconceptions that different patients have, um, and, and it's really important to try to, to figure out what those are to be able to explain to the patient uh, uh, why this medicine is really the, the right choice for them and that it will is, do more benefit than uh, harm. So this is um, a tool, and uh, there are more information about this tool and some of the other things that we've discussed today that are available uh, in the downloadable practice aid, which is part of this program. But this is just something you can, you can give the patient and you can uh, click off these boxes to try to see 
how many of these boxes did the patient feel had been checked in their visit. And in you know, the ideal scenario, we, we hope that we check all of them. In reality, probably it's rare that we get all nine of these checked off. And if you read through these, you could see that these are really the foundation of this shared decision-making uh, that, that would be most desirable. Uh, so worth, worth you know, trying this out on a few patients to see uh, how good a job uh, we're doing in terms of the patient's assessment of, of what they heard from us and how well they understood uh, the rationale for the treatments that we recommended. All right, let's jump into another uh, case. This is Andrew, 68-year-old man. He's living in a homeless shelter. He wakes up with left-sided weakness and numbness. He comes into the local ER a day later. He's got uncontrolled hypertension, but he's not taking any medications. He does smoke uh, two to three packs of cigarettes a day. He's denying alcohol use. His labs show that he's got an elevated L LDL. He's got some mild liver function uh, elevations. His creatinine is not uh, perfect. His EKG shows left ventricular hypertrophy. His blood pressure is higher than we would like at 158 over 96. On exam, he's got uh, evidence that he's had a, a small stroke with left-sided face and arm weakness that's been there for now uh, more than 24 hours. And he's got evidence clearly on a CT that there's a subacute infarct in his right frontal parietal region. And he's got some atherosclerosis being visualized in his intracranial vessels and an old infarct uh, in the right cerebellum. So Clay, uh, what are you gonna recommend for Andrew? Yeah, so for me, um, <laughs> I, I certainly wouldn't recommend anticoagulation in someone like this, but any platelet therapy, I would definitely recommend. He meets the, the criteria for uh, dual antiplatelet therapy. And um, in this case, I, I'd probably um, favor clopidogrel because it's going to be easier for him to, to, to deal with. It's, uh, for, I'm sure it's going to be, uh, make it easier for him to, to, to get it. Um, uh, maybe we can even discharge him with it. Um, and also the QD um, benefits, too, are there. Um, so that's what I'd, I'd recommend. Yeah. So, uh, what if he says, well, look, I, I, I don't have any money. I, I can't, I can't pay for this. Yeah. I mean, honestly, the key is to get him that medicine right at the beginning, right? So the separation occurs right away. The risk is greatest right away. So we can get him started on the meds for sure in the hospital. And man, this is where I would bend over backwards to get him the supply that he needs, you know, 21 days worth, you know, he's going to be discharged on 20 pills. Oh, come on, you know, a dollar a pill that I think the, the safety net system, whatever it is locally, should be able to cover that as opposed to the much higher costs associated with him being rehospitalized. And, and yeah, the, the uh, initial cost effectiveness analyses in this setting suggest that these treatments are cost saving. So, you know, it just makes sense from a societal perspective to get him on it. Now, whether I'll take it or not, it's another question. Yeah, somehow he's finding enough money to buy a couple of packs of cigarettes a day, which are clearly more expensive than, you know, if, if we really choose, uh, you know, hyd hydrochlorothiazide or some very inexpensive uh, antihypertensive, hopefully we can get him on that since obviously he's got LVH, he's got chronic hypertension. So that's a, a big impact on recurrent stroke risk. That would be nice to get that under control. And then... Hopefully for the long run, he can you know, default to maybe just a, a, an aspirin a day, which again, very inexpensive in the long run once he gets through that you know, three-week period where you're gonna hand him the, the pills of uh, uh, clopidogrel. Great, um, and, and clearly you know, getting him to understand that the best we, we can, that although he's had minor events uh, to date, that. What we're really worried about is he's going to come into the ER with the big left MCA occlusion and, and leave him, uh, you know, disabled for the rest of his life. So trying to understand the gravity of the matter uh, and see if we can get him on board that this is a big warning that, uh, uh, you know, you want to get things together to avoid the, the bad outcome. Uh, let's talk about uh, Marlene. Uh, this is our last patient. She's a 71-year-old woman, recently widowed. She lives alone. She began feeling vertiginous. Uh, you know, she wakes up uh, two days ago, and then she's got an episode of diplopia, which lasts later, uh, 20 minutes later in the day when she woke up with a vertigo. Uh, she didn't come in um, until a couple days later. That's when 
Uh, she was able to get an appointment in the office. She had a minor stroke four years ago. She doesn't drink or smoke. Laboratories look okay, except her glucose is a little bit high. Uh, she's got some irregular heart rate, but it's not a fib. She's a, a sinus rhythm. Her blood pressure is 131 over 77. She's on antihypertensives, a statin, and, and she's on baby aspirin. Um, she's got some evidence of uh, posterior circulation trouble with an unsteady gait. Uh, and she, in fact, does have two small subacute infarcts in the left cerebellum uh, and the left occipital lobe. And there's an old uh, uh, infarct on the right side as well in the cerebellum. Her NIH stroke score scale is three. All right, last, last case, Clay, how would you uh, advise Marlene? Yeah, so, so this one's a little tricky, right? So she would not have been enrolled in any of the trials. They all required the event to have occurred within 24 hours. But the, her risk of recurrence is still quite high. And we did, we did look at this in modeling. We haven't done this yet in, in TALIS, but we did do this for uh, Chance did it and uh, Point did it, um, that you're, you can expect that the benefit will, will persist, will be there, even for treatment out to three days after the initial event just by modeling you know, how those curves separate. So I would be inclined to go ahead and recommend dual antiplatelet therapy for her. She's already coming in on an aspirin. I, you know, that makes me even a little more uncomfortable just saying, oh, keep on the aspirin. And I, I don't believe that you know, clopidogrel alone is, is any, any better, even somebody who's been previously on aspirin. So I would just go ahead and put her on dual antiplatelet therapy. And I don't think it matters too much which of the two combinations you use in her um, and I, you know, I think I'd discuss that and understand her a little better before making a recommendation. Yeah, that sounds great. Uh, one thing we've seen in, in multiple studies is that if you're taking aspirin and you have an event, that identifies you as an even higher risk person uh, than if, if you had your event uh, not on any antiplatelet therapy. So I'm seeing her as a high risk patient. She's all, obviously got uh, some older infarcts as well as these uh, new ones. So I would, I would agree that it, it's too bad we couldn't get the advantage of, you know, trying to prevent uh, events in the first, you know, couple of days because she came in late. But certainly, as, as you've shown in, in multiple studies, the, the whole first week is a, a higher risk week. Uh, so I would, I would agree going with the 21-day course of, of the double therapy and then working, you know, as hard as possible on her risk factors as well. Terrific. Well, uh, we do have uh, a little bit more information about what happened with Marlene. Uh, uh, antiplatelet therapy was uh, recommended, uh, but what she's telling you is that uh, after her first stroke, she was on antiplatelet therapy and she cut her hand while she was cooking and she bled all over the place. So now that you wanna put her on double antiplatelet therapy, She's really concerned that, you know, she's at high risk for bleeding because of what happened before. And, you know, can't we just get by with one agent rather than two? So how would you respond to that concern? Yeah, I, you know, the risk is just too high. And we're talking about a short period of time. So I would reassure her and tell her, you know, this is not a big risk. It's not a zero risk, but it's not a big risk. And that um, it's in her best interest to just be careful um, and uh, um, in, but just for three weeks, um, she can do this and that could have an impact for the rest of her life. Uh, so that would be my, my approach is to sort of work with her. Okay. You'd also give her an opportunity to say, hey, I, I, I can't do the cooking for the next few weeks here. You, somebody else has got to handle the sharp knives. But absolutely agree that, that people can be aware of the fact that there's a little bit of an increase in bleeding when they see the numbers from the trials, these are really not frightening numbers in terms of the risks of major bleeds. So I, I think, uh, you know, some of what we talked about in that last session of really getting into understanding where this fear is coming from uh, and, and trying to get other family members to be supportive of the decision to encourage her that in this high risk period, we really don't want her to have a stroke and the chance of a stroke is so much higher than her uh, having blood everywhere from another cooking accident. All right, that brings us uh, really to the, the end of our program. The key takeaways from this uh, last section is that shared decision-making can improve adherence to therapy and it can improve patient satisfaction. 
Uh, it also uh, begins with a supportive, non-judgmental, unbiased conversation with the patient, and it can be tailored depending on whether the greatest need is knowledge, skills, or reinforcement of positive behaviors. So that brings us to the end of our uh, formal presentations. Thank you, uh, Dr. Albers and uh, Dr. Johnston, for an excellent uh, series of presentations. We have uh, an equally uh, excellent collection of questions from uh, both uh, folks here uh, in person as well as the virtual uh, attendees. So Dr. Albers, I'll get it back to you. I know you have some questions that you know, we've sent to you. Um, if you want to go ahead and, and get started with our Q&A session, uh, you know, we can uh, get some of these answers out to the audience. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we did get some fantastic questions. Uh, some of the questions that came in, I, I think, were handled pretty well through the presentation, but a number of, of them were not. So, uh, Clay, let's, let's start off with this first question, uh, which it says, when should antiplatelet therapy be restarted if the patient has an ischemic stroke and there's hemorrhagic conversion? What's your recommendation then? Yeah, so, um, well, the recommendation, first of all, is to get someone on antiplatelet therapy in a situation like that at some point. So in the trials support that, that, uh, that folks who've had a, a bleed, even an intracranial bleed on antiplatelet therapy should be put back on it in real trials. Um, but we don't have real trials that tell us about timing, the, <laughs> the question here. And so it's really, you know, a judgment call. You know, is it a week? Is it two weeks? Um, it probably doesn't need to be longer than two weeks. Um, and, you know, how do I make it personally? I'd be curious to hear what you do, Greg, but you know, typically we wait, you know, for, for just little petechial hemorrhages, we're not so worried and start it before a patient's discharge to make sure it gets started. And then for those with, you know, real um, hemorrhagic conversion that, that causes mass effect, then we, we would wait a couple weeks for those kinds of patients. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we look at the type of hemorrhagic transformation that we're talking about because we think of these mild petechial hemorrhages as part of the normal evolution of virtually every stroke that's of a significant size. So we're comfortable starting the antiplatelet therapy with those mild petechial hemorrhages. But when you start to get into a pH1 or pH2 hematoma, obviously that's a different situation where we're going to hold off for, for at least a couple of weeks. And then again, we're looking at risk versus benefit. Is this really a, a high risk patient uh, uh, versus a lower risk patient? But uh, we, we don't have great clinical trial dates. So you have to use your judgment ring, the risk, risk of hemorrhage versus the risk of a recurrent ischemic event. You wanna pick the next question, Clay? Yeah, sure. So this one, it could almost be a trick question. It's, <laughs> is dual antiplatelet therapy indicated in a stroke with only or predominantly sensory symptoms? Yeah, so um, we reviewed the, the trial inclusion criteria and I guess the question is, it, is it a stroke or is it just a TIA with sensory symptoms? It, that's um, it, yeah. And, and what is the NIH stroke scale associated with that? Because you know, we had different rules for the different trials, but we were looking at NIH stroke scales of, of three in the clopidogrel trials or five in the ticagrelor. ABCD squared, we needed four to six, depending on the trial. So uh, what I'm hearing here is probably someone who didn't quite make the criteria for the studies, so wouldn't have been enrolled. Um, but then the question is, are there other features that really make you think this is a high-risk patient? Uh, and you know, there's a subsequent question that, how closely do you follow these rules, right? With, you know, if it's a, a score of four, they wouldn't have made it into point or chance but would, would you still be comfortable with clopidogrel? And, and Clay, as somebody who ran these trials, uh, how, how strictly in your clinical practice are you, you following the rules that you used in, in the trials? Yeah, not so strictly. Um, you know, really the ABC squared score was designed to identify people who had had a, had a real event. Um, and so if you really believe the patient had a real transient ischemic event, in the brain, then, then, you know, then that's a high risk patient. I mean, that's really my take on it. And it does work better though than our judgment. So I'll just say that our judgment's not particularly good about whether an event was really a TI or not. So the, the score is useful. In this case, if the patient has infarct, then use the AHA definition the trials did. That's a stroke, ABCD square score is irrelevant. If it's sensory only symptoms, they're still a candidate for, for the trial. Terrific. 
Um, let me combine uh, two questions into one. These are questions about how to handle patients who are on their way to endarterectomy or carotid stenting. So one of them is, if you think you're gonna be heading quickly to endarterectomy, do you go ahead and load up with uh, the dual antiplatelet therapy because the surgeon might not be thrilled about that? Uh, and then secondly, is after they've come back, they've had their successful endarterectomy, uh, but they're still within the 21 days after their event, are you gonna still go with the dual therapy now that presumably the, the guilty party has been removed? And these are great questions. We struggled with these for the trials too, because as you can imagine, this would really matter for some patients in the trials. And um, basically where we came down is many surgeons are comfortable doing surgery on both drugs. So find out whether you know, your vascular surgeon is one of those <laughs> surgeons for, um, for stenting they should be on both drugs. I mean, most, uh, everybody wants them on dual antiplatelet so, so that makes that easy if that's the choice. Um, and then, you know, do you, how long should they be off before surgery is done? Again, it's surgeon dependent, and it's also a bit drug dependent. Here's where ticagrelor is a little bit advantageous because it's more rapid off. So, you know, you have a, the potential if the, if the surgeon insists on it being off, you have the potential to get there quicker with ticagrelor than you would with clopidogrel. So, you know, again, there's the, uh, it takes several days. Uh, so the three days is three to four days for clopidogrel is probably enough. Um, two days for ticagrelor is probably enough. But again, it's probably not that important. A bunch of observational studies have shown that you can safely do surgery on dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, they're just observational studies. We don't have randomized trials in that setting. And then your question about after. So again, there's really no great data on this, right? Um, because you can do the surgery safely on it, then of course there's a range of when you might start safely afterwards. So if it's an uncomplicated surgery, you could, I would restart that. I, I should answer that part of your question. I would because they remain at high risk, even though the stenosis is fixed, they're still at quite high risk for a while. So I still would do it. Um, and, you know, again, I think it's, it's arbitrary, honestly. A couple of days is not unreasonable. Great. Yeah, I agree. It's certainly surgery dependent on the issue of operating on dual therapy. We, we do have uh, one of our more prominent surgeons who really thinks there's a lot more bleeding with an endodirectomy on, on dual therapy. So if we know that's where we're headed, we may be a little more conservative. But often at the time you're gonna start this, you're trying to get it in as quickly as possible. You may not even know that this is a patient for endarterectomy. Yeah. Um, you wanna pick the next one, Clay? Yeah, yeah, I think this is, this, is a, this is a real quick one, but just any drug interactions to, to be cautious of. Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, obviously the um, antithrombotic or uh, thrombolytic agents are, are obvious. I think maybe what the questioner is getting into is that that there, there is some uh, evidence that, that ticagrelor can increase the serum concentrations of some of the, the statin agents. So some people are a little bit more cautious with statin doses uh, in ticagrelor patients. And, and for clopidogrel, probably the more talked about uh, interaction is the, the omiprazole perilosec, which may decrease the serum concentrations of the active metabolites of clopidogrel. So the, those are the things that come to mind for me. Any, any others that you think of? No, no, those, those are right. I mean, we had some concerns about those agents for the trials, no surprise. But honestly, it wasn't um, an issue. And ultimately, we, um, we, we decided not to, um, not to worry about any of those drugs. I uh, didn't see any real evidence that, that um, they matter. Just the you know, anticoagulants, obviously, other antiplatelet agents, those matter. But, um, but beyond that, we didn't see any real impact of the, of the other classes of drugs that you mentioned. Yeah, terrific. Uh, so next question has to do with the duration of, of treatment. And obviously we talked about the, the 21 to 30 days, but I think what the questioner is getting at is what if you've got somebody who's really got a lot of risk factors, they've got diabetes or they've got uh, chronic kidney disease or they're elderly, you know, uh, do, do you stretch that, those limits and do you go longer for some patients and shorter for others? No, because I just don't think we have the evidence the, um, you know, longer there were, it's not as though, I mean, it's actually a good question. If somebody wants to look at this in point, you can't look at it in, in chance because all treatment was stopped at 21 days. You can't look at it 
in uh, Talus because all treatment was stopped at 30 days. But of course, in, in point, we had 90 day dual antiplatelet therapy. Um, and we honestly did not look at that question. Is there a subgroup that particularly benefited between 21 days and 90 days? And it's a fair question. So, you know, again, that, that data set is available publicly and a lot of people are looking at it. That's a, that's a fine question to ask. But right now, I, a priori, I don't have any reason to expect that that, that group would either differentially benefit or be um, at, at risk uh, from dual antiplatelet therapy beyond that 21 days. Great. I agree. Um, let's see, you wanna pick the next one? Um, yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit about drug failures. There's some questions about that. Does that change your decision if a patient comes in on aspirin or comes in on clopidogrel about what you would you would use? Yeah, we address a little bit about that. Uh, you know, I always see this as a, a high risk patient. Uh, we we learned that uh, way back in the the wars trial. Those who came in and were taking warfarin had much higher risk of recurrent event, although their uh, uh, response to warfarin versus aspirin didn't differ. Uh, so what I'm thinking about for those patients is what, what risk factors can I, can I control? Do, do I have their treatable risk factors under control? Uh, and is there something else going on? Uh, you know, could this be somebody who's got a condition that really should be treated with an anticoagulant rather than an antiplatelet therapy? And am I missing that? Uh, you know, is this somebody with antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, or they've got paroxysmal atrial fibrillation or a hypercoagulable state? Um, <clears throat> but, you know, if I don't find that, I'm going to just go to the, the standard. I'm going to, you know, not worry so much about the agent that they chose. If they're a candidate for dual therapy, uh, I'll go with dual therapy. From a psychological point of, of view, if, if you were on clopidogrel and, and aspirin, you know, people often don't want to go back to what you failed. So it is wonderful to have more alternatives. And that may be somebody you'd be, you know, more anxious to, to go with the ticagrelor. And, and I think there, there was a question about, uh, you know, what if you're not in the situation of dual therapy and you're, you're failing clopidogrel? Is there, you know, a reason to go on ticagrelor? And uh, you, you pointed out that, um, you know, that we didn't get a win in Socrates, uh, but we came awfully close. Uh, you know, the single uh, ticagular versus aspirin, if you looked at the endpoint of ischemic stroke, it, it was statistically significant. All the endpoints went in the right direction. If you looked at some of the subgroup papers, like those with uh, atherosclerosis, the, you know, they had a statistically significant benefit. So personally, I, I don't have a, an issue going with uh, ticagular on its own in somebody who's, who's failed uh, clopidogrel uh, and, and is looking for another alternative. What, yeah. what do you think? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, 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 of course, it's not approved for that indication, and and uh, the it just as you pointed out, Socrates really is a negative trial. On the other hand, yeah, I mean, just treatment effect was actually greater there in Socrates than in in uh, Capri. A longer duration of follow up, obviously, in in Capri, the the trial that we used to justify um, clopidogrel alone for long term treatment. So, uh, so I, I don't think that's unreasonable at all, particularly in somebody that you have concerns about, you know, a CYP2C19 polymorphism uh, um, that would limit uh, clopidogrel's effectiveness. Um, hey, Carmine, how are we doing on time? Do you have questions there that you want to go to, or should I ask Greg a, another couple? I think you can ask uh, one more question, and then maybe we'll take one more here, and then that should bring us to time, I think. Okay. Um, so, Greg, the, this question of of what to do after TPA or thrombectomy. Um, do you ever use dual antiplatelet therapy in that setting? Yeah, it's a, a great question. Um, you know, there was a, a trial, a uh, European trial years ago that, that asked the question, you know, do we really need this 24 hour window? Can we start the antiplatelet therapy within that 24 hour window? And it got stopped early because there was too much hemorrhage. So we, we don't break the rules about, uh, you know, holding the antithrombotic therapy for 24 hours after TNK or, or Alteplase. Um, uh, but then, you know, the, the question is, you know, what do you do after that? 
right? If, if this patient really is somebody in a, a high risk category, uh, you know, who, who would, you know, pr presumably uh, be at, at very high risk uh, because of severe atherosclerosis, multiple events, et cetera, we would consider the, the dual antiplatelet therapy for, you know, two, three weeks. However, of course, these are patients who would not have made it into these trials, right? The, the patients right. who received uh, thrombolytics, they would not have made it. So we don't have the evidence-based data. So again, it, it's judgment. And I'll say in general, we're just using a single antiplatelet therapy in those settings. How about, how about you, Clay? Yeah, same, same for us, Greg. I mean, I, I agree with you though. It's a really high-risk group. You know, we did a study looking at the uh, patients enrolled in the original TPA trial and the, the risk of further deterioration due to ischemia is actually quite high even higher than in this general group that we studied in, in all these trials that we've just been discussing. So the risk of recurrent ischemia is quite high. They're likely to benefit from you know, pronounced antiplatelet therapy, just like in the coronary beds, right? So um, I, bet, <laughs> I bet it works. Um, but just as you said, no, no evidence from clinical trials right now. They were, they were excluded because of concerns about, the, about hemorrhage. That'll be the next trial, but it'll be a hard one to do. Yeah. All right, Carmine, we have some uh, local questions there from yeah. the New Orleans crowd. Yes, we do, we do. We have one that might be quick and then one that brings us full circle, I think, and it's a great one to end on. So one quick question on Ticagrelor. Um, you brought up the you know, breathlessness, is, and the question is, is that dose dependent in your experience? So we usually have just been stuck with <laughs> a single dose. Uh, our, our trials use the, the 90 BID. Uh, so I, I don't know, the cardiac folks might know. Clay, do you have any further insight on that? No, single dose, so don't have experience on it. I mean, I'll tell you, it generally just goes away. So, um, you know, just writing it out um, is usually the best approach. And I realized with dipyridamol, we got used to reducing dose and then pushing through and all that. It's not like that. It's not as, as nasty as the, as the uh, headaches were with dipyridamol or as persistent. So it, 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 it ended up really not being an issue um, in the stroke trials. My, okay, there we go. And then the last question I think brings us full circle. This refers to the first case I think that you presented, the case of Eleanor. And the question is, what, what agent uh, would you continue Eleanor on after three weeks of dual uh, antiplatelet therapy? Want to start on that one, Clay? I, it would, for me, it's still aspirin. Um, you know, there's uh, the strongest data long-term uses for aspirin. I realize there's some concerns about, you know, aspirin's impact waning over time, but the data don't really suggest that that's the case. It continues to be a benefit, um, you know, weeks to months after an acute event, it's cheap, it's easy. You can miss a day and that's no disaster. Um, so it would still be aspirin, 81 milligrams. Yeah, I think, I think it's dealer's choice and, and certainly the guidelines would support that one could go um, you know, either with aspirin or, or clopidogrel in that situation. Uh, one of the questions that we didn't get to was uh, a couple of different questions about if you're going with aspirin, are you gonna use the enteric coated versus uh, non-enteric coated, and, and certainly there have been some mixed results of studies on this where uh, there's uh, lower bioavailability of these enteric coated. They're not absorbed as well in the higher pH environment of the small intestine than, you know, that you're, you know, trying to protect the stomach. Um, so, you know, I think that's one of the considerations if, if you're going with aspirin, do you want to, you know, lean towards a, a non-enteric coated uh, formulation that, that might provide a little bit more efficacy. Again, the jury's not completely in on that. Uh, but I also, I don't think clopidogrel is an unreasonable chance uh, opportunity. You go back, um, you know, to the Capri trial where you had 6,000 stroke patients going long-term clopidogrel head-to-head -head versus aspirin. And although the results weren't statistically different in those, those patients, they certainly were compatible with the overall uh, results of the study showing a a very mild uh, benefit of clopidogrel over aspirin. And in terms of the side effect uh, profile, there was less uh, GI bleeding, there's less gastric uh, uh, irritation from the clopidogrel. So again, particularly if it's somebody who we're worried about, they've had previous uh, 
gastritis, GI bleeding issue, that might be a reason that I would lean to the clopidogrel monotherapy uh, in Eleanor's longer term state. All right, thank you. So I think we could probably close, but do you have any final closing thoughts before uh, we uh, end the evening for the audience? I mean, for just for me, um, thank you all for, for coming and uh, enjoy uh, New Orleans or your, or your evening at home. Um, and, uh, and just remember, I mean, we're, I think we're horribly underutilizing dual antiplatelet therapy right now. Uh, there, uh, we need, probably need to study it more closely, but I think there are many people who would have been enrolled in these trials and now evidence suggests strongly that they should be treated with dual antiplatelet therapy, guidelines now support it, who are not getting treated. So please look at that in your practice and the practices around your town and, and let's all try to work together to improve the outcomes for patients. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. It really uh, a shame not to have us all live and in person uh, uh, together to, uh, to enjoy New Orleans and to be able to have uh, you know, in-person conversations about this. But it's great to see the tremendous interest and in the very uh, sophisticated questions that are coming in from the audience. And I'd just like to, to point out uh, again that uh, not only are we underutilizing the agents, but oftentimes the patients aren't, aren't taking the therapies and it holds not only for the antiplatelets, but really getting the blood pressure and the other risk factors under control has such a huge impact on reducing the, the risk of stroke. So I think it's something that all of us can, can work even harder on on our practices. But, uh, pleasure to uh, participate and hope, hope to see everybody next year. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post-test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash SPE 860. This activity is supported by an independent educational grant from AstraZeneca LP. This activity is certified by Medical Learning Institute Incorporated. This activity is developed with our educational partner, PVI, Peerview Institute for Medical Education.